I was joking the last couple of days about Major League Baseball's self-imposed deadlines because, all right, it's Monday or we won't do a deal. Now we're going to extend it to Tuesday. So maybe this isn't the best way to look at this, but if they figure out a deal in the next week or two and it ends up being a 150-game season, do you really think that is that big of a deal? I, I already feel like baseball has lost fans through the last couple months, through the lockout. Nobody's talking about baseball in December. I'm guessing less folks, and I asked this, less folks were probably buying baseball tickets, baseball gear. I think baseball has already suffered. I do think, though, like if this becomes a 100-game season, I think it's an absolute disaster. And you can make the case it's already a disaster, but if they come to an agreement in the next two weeks and it ends up being 144, 150, I hate to say it, I and, and look, some folks are going to lose wages, 100%. And I, I feel bad for those folks. And it's not just the players, as we said. It's the ticket takers. It's the folks that work at Bush Stadium. It's, it's all of the bars and restaurants around. Absolutely. But I think from a baseball standpoint, baseball is already in a bad spot. But this was a fake deadline. It, it was a deadline to eliminate some games. But really, do you think if baseball came to an agreement tomorrow, they couldn't figure out a way to come to 162? Come on. Like well, with well, a couple well, seven-inning doubleheaders, it's probably not going to happen. But my point is, to me, there's a big difference between 144 games, 150 games. If, if this thing lasts two months, if spring training doesn't start in a couple weeks, it's going to be way, way, way worse, in my opinion. I Now... I agree with you, so don't think I'm like disagreeing. But to me, it's not all or nothing. It's the degree of how it hurts the sport. I agree with you. If it's a 100-game season, it's a disaster. If they lose some games. But to me, Major League Baseball had some momentum, okay? Because a lot of people changed their habits during the lockdown when there wasn't. And... Fan interest coming out of the lockdown and when things started up again, it wasn't the same fan participation in terms of viewing going to games as it was in the beginning. And then baseball got some momentum. And now I think that momentum has been lost, and I think that will hurt them to a certain degree. But I also think if they can fix this in short term, they will be able to mitigate a lot of that damage. Well, what's But there is some degree. And then the other thing is, I really don't think it's a fake deadline. I understand you weren't trying to be like hard guy with that. But both sides said we need a month of spring training, so it boils down to math. And I do agree if they really wanted to throw in some games with the fake seven-inning doubleheaders, which, by the way, I never liked, even though it made for quicker games and everything. You know, if you have a sport that goes nine innings, they should play <laughs> nine innings, you know. So, But I, I agree with most of what you're saying. So what do the owners need to do? Jimmy, you talked about that too, and and you said the right off the bat they should have been like here seven seven hundred fifty thousand minimum wage, and just kind of throw that at uh, the union and say, okay, here's the start. The optics are good on it, and then kind of go from there. But they're not even yeah. There's other things they you know you we used to call it a luxury tax. Now you know now it's a competitive uh, tax, um, and uh, in some cases it, it could be seen as a salary cap. And, and look, I, there are a lot of smarter people than me dealing with it but i kind of agree with something charlie said and it shows that i actually do listen to you like you agree with Aww. fixing the bottom the basement right fix the basement you know for the people who are at the lower levels to me it's not a lot of money if i'm the owners if i'm the owner and i'm not i say what do you want for the for the for the minimum yeah. salary yep okay we'll meet you there yeah and then build off that but there are a lot of bigger issues and i understand that the I don't like the fact these owners are dumb. They're not dumb. Okay, they're not dumb. <laughs> Players aren't dumb. No, I, 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 you can say this side's greedy. That's a, both of them are, are representing their interests, which is how it works in America, and they got to find a common ground. I think they will, but if they don't, and it goes on for a while, it's disastrous for the sport. See, so just based on all of the reporting from this, I feel like. If you look at it from the MLB minimum standpoint, I feel like the owners came pretty dang close. I actually think if, if I'm the players, so Jeff Passan, as of yesterday, said the, uh, the MLB's best and final offer, an increase of minimums 
from 675K to 700K, moving up $10,000 per year. The MLB PA, so the player's previous offer, minimums at 725K, going up $20,000 per year. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they're, they're close. They're pretty close. So I think I think it's the CBT that really is the sticking point because MLB has not changed their threshold, which is basically for the next five years, 220, 220, 220, 224, 230. So that's per team. So that's $220 million per team for what is a de facto salary cap. It's basically the luxury tax. I apologize right. for my voice here. But Major League right. Baseball, they want 238, 244, <clears throat> 250, 256, 263. That's per team. They're really far off there. They're really yeah. far off there. Uh 855-282-8255. Chime in, guys. Uh, Rock the Rector Ruder, Ruder chimes in and goes, guys, just remember the poor owners aren't making any money and owning a team really isn't profitable. This is all on the owners. Gino chimes in and goes, this is 100% on the owners trying to break the union. Anybody that doesn't see that hasn't been watching. Yeah, I agree. To me, and, and when I say it's all on the owners, it, it's always on both sides. But if you're having to assess blame, to me, it, it's on the owners. And I feel like the owners have had big wins in the last couple CBAs, and the players wanted slash needed a win, and they're absolutely digging in for one. Because, again, I think the minimum salary is pretty close. It seems like they're they're getting to common ground with the draft lottery. Now, clearly, the 12 versus 14 team playoff is a sticking point, but everything that I've read is that because each negotiation— the players know, okay, they could get a deal that is a win for them, but they're not always going to get a home run, right? When, it, when it's a negotiation, it's a compromise, but I think if the players came out of this with, with a win, they would feel good about that. The players, from everything I've read and heard, is they look at the 12-team playoff as they're already making a concession to the owners. So they do that this year, they get something back for it. Now, if the owners want 14, you give them 14 at the next CBA and you get something else back. Now, I know the owners, they'll say, okay, we'll raise the minimums higher if it's 12 teams versus 14 teams. But I think as a union, as a player's union, you only have so many trump cards. You only have so much leverage. And that's a card they want to play. But hey, let's go from 10 teams. Let's go to 12. Give us a little something. Let's see how it works. Next CBA... We'll probably give you 14, but we want something else in return. I get you on that. Uh, if you're going to be Nostradamus on this, what do you think is going to happen, Charlie, Jimmy? If you had to guess what's going to happen in the next couple months here, what would you say, Seeing every, collecting all the data that you do, what's going to happen in the next couple months here? To me, I don't really know, as this thing drags on, where the leverage swings. It depends on how the players' union has rallied the troops, how they have prepared for folks, you know, players that need that income. Um, I don't know where the leverage falls. And so to me, it's, it's, and then maybe it's a cop out. It's hard for me to assess what's going to happen. I just know that, and Charlie pointed this out, the more games you lose, the more you're damaging the sport. And that's bad for both sides. So whatever they have to do, I'm hoping it happens, but I, it's hard for me to uh, handicap I get who's going to give at this point. And so don't you think, I understand also that when you're in a public negotiation, there's a lot of things leaked to the media to make public opinion, sentiment, kind of believe, oh, a deal is going to get done. And I feel like especially looking back, we've now seen that many times, and maybe I'm too pro player from this standpoint but I think as we now peel back the onion it's pretty obvious that most of the times that there's been let's say positivity that oh a deal's going to get done that seems to me like it's almost always major league baseball through a spokesperson <clears throat> or two media sources saying hey there's momentum and then when it when it falls when it falters like yesterday well, now the sentiment is on, oh, there was so much positive momentum on Monday. They, they had such common ground. They negotiated all night. 
Major League Baseball even decided, hey, we're close. We're going to extend our artificial deadline to 5 o'clock Eastern time on Tuesday. We're close, guys. Where on the player's side, it seems like they were never really that close. And I think, I get it, it's a strategy, but I think that's Major League Baseball and the owners trying to manipulate fans through the media, which both sides are doing, because this is also in the court of public opinion. But I think that's what has happened. I think whenever we heard about positivity, it sure seemed like the players never thought it was that close. Now look, I had someone who's as close to this as you could be before this started. I haven't heard from them since. But they told me, because they weren't expecting it to be easy, they said, whatever you read, even if it's these guys that are very good reporters, you're not getting the full picture. Mm-hmm. Don't believe any of it on either side because you're you're getting intentional leaks here and there. So while I read this stuff, and yes, of course, when it real when you when you saw that it seemed like the thing had gone off the rails after some momentum, that's all I took from it because I was told going into it that the even the people that think that they're close to the sources aren't getting the full picture as to what's going on with the negotiations. And so, and you tell me if, if I'm wrong, I'm, I may be wrong, but don't you think because you had the marathon negotiations on Monday and it did seem positive and we're coming back, we, we negotiated all night long. I started to feel like, okay, maybe, maybe they are close. If, if, if reporters and MLB spokespeople are saying that, okay, maybe there's going to be a deal. And I do think in the court of public opinion, if you're taking that at face value, then you'd say, oh, well, now it's it's on the players. It's on the players because I, because everybody from MLB and all these, all these uh, reporters are saying that they were close, and now the players don't want out. I bet you the players, when they went home and checked Twitter, they're probably really pissed because they're thinking, no, we're actually not close. In yeah. their in their opinion, I, I want like, I think in fairness, wouldn't you say most reporters and and that may, you could say they're right. I'm not I'm not even d- disputing whether most most reporters are on the player side. You can you can get that sense from the tweets and everything. And that the days of you know you, you're just supposed to report the facts are over. I get that every reporter is in a sense an entertainer now and puts their opinions out there along with the news. So. You know, maybe that factors into it. I just know that if it were, yeah, this is on the players when they, you know, I didn't buy that. And when I buy this was the owners making it seem like it's on the players. I'm not buying I don't know because I don't know what's actually going on. And it kind of goes back to one of the things about social media is it's really easy for a handful of people in any realm, whatever, if it's business, if it's politics, sports, to control the narrative yep. on social media. And so I don't trust a lot of what I see unless <clears throat> I know firsthand. And I will tell you this, like, I don't bother players. I don't bother front office people to find out what's going on yeah. with the negotiations. I For don't. one, we're not covering mm-hmm. it at Bally, so it's not my job. Yep. And I don't. I also think you have to respect people's position that I can't say anything. Exactly. And if they've told you yeah. I can't say anything on both sides, so I don't really know... I don't think I have the whole story. Here's where I'm also with the players on this front. I think the CBT, or the luxury tax, is very, 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 very important to them for this reason. They also know the game. You can raise the minimum salary and still not have higher payrolls. You know know why? Because what do you think? The owners are smart, and they're business people, and that's great. What will they do if now you have to pay more for the average minimum player. Guess what? That, to me, will further get rid of any middle class in baseball. Right? So so gone, in my opinion, are probably... There's going to be way fewer guys making two. a million, 1.5, yep. 2 million, because guess what? It becomes an economic argument of, here is, let's say, 29, 30, 31-year-old veteran who's a free agent, but he's not that great. Right? Mm-hmm. But that guy... Let's say he makes two million. I think they phase that guy out. He might be seven percent better than triple A twenty three year old player, but they can pay that gentleman now seven hundred thousand. So I think by raising the minimum salary, the owners can still not have a higher payroll. And that's to me why they want that luxury tax higher, because guess what? 
They want Steve Cohen of the Mets to give out Max Scherzer deals, and they want the Dodgers to give out the humongous deals and raise the boat for everybody. Don't you think we've already seen, as you would put it, and I think it's a, a good comparison, the middle class in baseball done away with? 100%. How many times have we, like, they could add a bat, but they're going with a young guy. I'm not saying the Cardinals. I'm talking about in baseball. There were a lot of guys on the beach that, that – that should have been in baseball and probably would at another time period, but because the the, the the main salary guys are so high, and as I said, anyone in baseball will tell you the, the greatest currency to possess in baseball is young talent. You can move that along, and you don't have to spend $5 million on a guy who can hit lefty pitching. And that's where, so look at it from the Cardinal standpoint. I understand why. And I like Kyle Schwarber. I think he's very good. He's going to get paid. He's going to get a multi-year deal. But you can understand why the Cardinals are saying, okay, Kyle Schwarber, he's probably going to be better than Juan Yepes next year. I think they know that, but it's it's potentially what? An AAV of $18 million versus now what's going to be probably 700000 Is his value going to be anywhere near? That's 20 times the salary. Yeah. So I think we focus on that. I think a better focus would be somebody like our guy Big City. And he might be listening right now. If Matt Adams, hey city, hey dude, Matt Adams, how old is he? Thirty-one, two, three, four. I think thirty-two. Okay, so I think so that player, if a Matt Adams, he hits free agency, if he can still hit in the big leagues, let's say he can hit a little bit better than Juan Yepes, but he he's gonna make what, one point five two? They're they're gonna they're gonna always go to that that twenty-four year old that's making seven hundred thousand. So uh, I think I think further the middle class folks are gonna be just bounced out. Yeah. First of all, I love City. Uh, great guy. Lives St. Louis. Could live in. Love St. Louis. Uh, we, we should get him on. We yeah. should. Get him to come in studio. Absolutely. If you would like that, I will 100%, arrange it. 100%. Um, but I also think it's more than when you talk about a guy like Schwarber, who I think would be a great fit for the Cardinals. I like City, too. I'd rather have City. Uh, but there's also risk versus reward. With a guy like Schwarber, what do you say he's going to make two years for for how many three years at at what annual rate? Well, he declined the qualifying offer, right, which is so I'm going to guess he's going to get let's just say a three year deal for is it fair to say fifty million? Okay, is that fair ish? Let Let's just say you're because it doesn't matter to me. But I, so you're talking about a fifty million dollar investment in a guy who could well revert to the guy who hit two thirty, right? <laughs> so it's not just can the guys that we have in house that are at a lower price come close to what Schwarber can do? It's also is it possible that they could be better because Schwarber, who's coming off a great year, could end up being a two thirty hitter for us? And the other guy, there's more of that. It's also risk involved when you're looking about giving out a contract like that. Hey, are we safer with these guys who we know the ceiling on the cost? And by the way, so I was I was driving around yesterday. Bernie was talking about this, and he had all the stats. He had all the data, which is very interesting to me because, and, and you should go back to 590thefan.com and listen to this segment, because he was saying how you look at basically the, the age groups and where folks are making money versus their production. And it's overwhelmingly when you're, let's say, 30 to 34, because you do get the big back end of those contracts as a free agent. So those guys are making a ton of money versus their production, which is not equal to the money they're making because you have to overpay in free agency, right? The yeah. last one, two years usually doesn't look great. But it's those young players where you're getting ridiculous, a ridiculous percentage of the production of Major League Baseball, of the runs, of the innings, and they're not making close to that because even if they up the, the minimums to 700000 whatever it is, those folks, they're not hitting free agency for six years. You can manipulate the seventh year. So by the time they're a free agent, they've given you their best six or seven Matt years. Carpenter. You can almost say, look, it almost makes sense to let them walk. If, if you let every single player walk when they hit free agency, you'd probably be a better organization. Yeah. I hate to say that, but you probably Save would. Save a lot of money. You probably would. Well, don't they do that in a lot of Florida and places like that? Well, if you're the Cardinals, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, you you jump in ahead of that where you get a discount, and the and the player gets certainty for the future. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But anytime you're you're putting out 
a long contract with a lot of money at stake, it, there's a risk. And like you said, you always overpay for a free agent. You're, you're paying them on what they did. And you know that usually if it's a long-term deal at, for a certain age group, you're paying for dead years at the end of the contract, right? That's just part of the bargain. 855-282-8255, Kyle chimes in. He goes, the Brad Mill- Miller reunion is the direction that I've been pushing for, keeping in mind the organization bays on the cusp. I already miss him. Through, I like Fred Miller a lot. I feel like he's the type of guy that's going to get squeezed out a little bit, though. Yeah, two to five million. I, I just think he'll probably have to make less because, again, I think the the weighing of the scales will be what is Brad Miller's production versus a Juan Yepes. I know they're not the exact same position, but that type of player. Why do you hate Lars Newbar? I, well, like I like Lars. That's my point. You the hate him. Bars, we are kind of talking is that about. We're talking about fourth outfielder DH types, platoon types, and I think the Cardinals would much rather go with the Newt Bars and the Yepeses of the world to have to pay anybody double that, which might be one point five million dollars per year. You know, uh, you, know ahead, what I, you know what I wish? We'll I break. wish we were discussing whether or not Paul DeYoung is going to find it again. <laughs> I wish we were <laughs> talking about who should be in the rotation. That's the normal stuff. That's what I miss because the baseball labor situation is is not good. Not good. And and the world right now not good. Not good. I want baseball back so I can fool myself that everything is okay. Well, you're stuck with the Blues tonight, and they're in New York City playing the Rangers. We got Terry Eight coming up at nine thirty. We are going to go to break. Eight five five two eight two eight two five five. Coming at you here, uh, somebody else chimed in and said, the players shouldn't make any concessions. I support the players' decision to hold out. This is about the future of baseball. The short term isn't important. It is to me.